Um, do you guys have any preference on like a number, like a minimum before we get started? I'd say we go with um, time. So maybe like yeah. 6, 6.05 and then we just- Yeah, I'll do about a five minutes-ish, I yeah. guess then. Yeah, we'll see. Yes, yeah, that works for me too. They're already coming in. Yeah. Yep. Welcome everybody. Are we on screen? Can they pick people like see yeah. us? Yeah. Okay. So all three of us are on screen right now. Um, after I introduce <laughs> you guys, I, I'm, I'm going to drop out just so if you, the focus can be on both of you. Um, I'll still be around, of course, if there's any issues or anything like that. I just didn't want to like pick my teeth live on <laughs> YouTube or something. Yeah. You know? Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Everything's public now. I will just stare into the distance <laughs> till we're ready to go. Welcome everybody. Uh, we'll be getting started shortly. Just gonna let a couple of people come in right now. I'm also drinking a monster energy drink because it's been <laughs> that kind of day, uh, but I am here for you, Suyi, so <laughs> Thank you. I'll be more and more here for you as I get through this drink. Yeah, some days call for that, don't they? It's Friday, mo it feels like a Friday. Too. Yeah, that's it. That's that's a good. Yeah. Point. Do you have a day job? You teach, right? Yeah, I um I teach. Well, currently, um, we have just finished the semester at the University of Arizona, mm -hmm. which I'm currently teaching at. Um, but I will be moving to another university in the fall. Oh, so, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I will. Be Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, there, there I will be teaching pre pretty much the same amount of classes, but yeah, um, I teach creative writing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, across wow. the board, yeah, at the, oh, at the yeah. undergrad level. Ooh, so I'm probably, I might ask you a question or two about that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and especially teaching like speculative, do you teach sort of straight up literary fiction as opposed to speculative I, fiction? No, I, I, I do teach um, mostly speculative work. Okay. Um, and then I, some, I, I think it, I really think about craft and sometimes a speculative story sells mm -hmm. that and I use that um, sometimes. Um, but I also teach classes that, I also teach some literature classes. Like my, in this coming year, I'm going to be teaching a class on African descended futurisms. Ooh, um, nice. Yeah, so I'm going to be teaching work from Naylor Hopkinson to like PJ Clark to, you know, even Janelle Monáe and Beyonce. So like, yeah, <laughs> pretty much across the board. So yeah, um, I pretty much try to pull from speculative fiction as much as possible, sometimes completely. Uh -huh. And of course, there are a lot of books that get labeled as literary that are clearly exactly. straight up speculative, you know? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that is very common within academia, so. Yes. Just want to let everybody who's joined know that we will be starting at about 6.05. We're just letting some people come in so we can you know, have a little bit of an audience. Looks like two people came in while I was talking, so we're almost there. So you, are you allowed to say what university you're going to? I can, I guess. <laughs> but you don't uh, have to. I don't want to pressure you. <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, I can. I will be moving to the University of Ottawa in Canada. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that, That's a I little different than Arizona. That's not it, quite different. It trippy. is very different. It is very different <laughs> from the U of A. Um, yeah. It's kind of like not not that different in the way the cities themselves move and orbit mm. around the university. Um, Tucson really orbits the University of Arizona and mm -hmm. Ottawa, if not that it is the capital, 
and you know orbits pretty much government um, stuff in the city. The university is like one of the key infra, um, you know, institutions that mm -hmm. are, are at the center of the university. Um, yeah, and the universities themselves are like similar in size and stuff. Oh, that's so, good. But yeah, so not not that much of a change, um, structure wise, but like climate wise. Climate like, wise. <laughs> yeah, it's like complete opposites. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do you like the desert? Are you a desert person? I don't mind. Are you happy it. to um, go? I don't mind it. <laughs> well, well, the summers in Arizona are like really, really, really not for the faint of heart. No. <laughs> um, but I lived, I lived in northern Nigeria for a year and a half, um, and it's like very, you know, Sahel to like, in um, it's very deserty. It's very semi-arid mm. in the way that Arizona is. Mm, um, so okay. the so the desert isn't new to me. It's just mm -hmm. a different kind of desert that's here um, mm -hmm. than than in northern Nigeria, which is like more Sahara type. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Oh, nice. So, yeah, yeah, but I, I think... will miss Arizona too. No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Miss the good food at least, right? <laughs> at least, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> oh no, you you guys can keep talking about Arizona if you want. I mean, we'll have time, we'll have time for that during the event. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna get the event started. I'm gonna introduce you guys. So, yeah, um, I just want to thank everyone who has joined so far, um, for joining uh, Green Apple Books on the Parks uh, virtual author event tonight. Um, I'm Jeff. I'll be introducing our authors. Uh, so tonight we are welcoming two amazing authors in conversation, Sui Davies Okambala and uh, Rebecca Roanhorse, to discuss his latest book, Son of the Storm, which is the first book of his new Nameless Republic trilogy. Uh, Son of the Storm is a West African inspired fantastical coming of age journey. That's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of adjectives. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, C's debut novel was David Mogo, God Hunter. And so in conversation with him is Rebecca Roanhorse, an award-winning writer of speculative fiction. Her catalog ranges from comics to fiction to nonfiction. Her latest book what, um, was the epic fantasy Black Sun, which we do carry here, if anyone's interested, um, which came out towards the end of last year, I believe October-ish. Um, so yeah, uh, without further ado, I'd just like to give the helm to our authors so they can converse and entertain everyone. Yeah. Well, thank you. And before you go, I think, Suyi, you're going to read first, right? Yes, so I if will. you could remove me from and let Suyi yeah. have the floor, and then you can throw me back on the screen when he's done. Yeah, I can do that. Let's see. Oh, great. So it's just me now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I wanted to start by saying if you have questions, you can actually leave them in the Q&A. Um, and you can like leave them there throughout. Um, and we will save some time to answer pretty much every question. So I'm going to be reading from Son of the Storm, obviously. Um, I'm going to be reading the first the fourth chapter, sorry, um, from chapter four, um, the second scene in chapter four. So a little bit of context, um, Son of the Storm is about pretty much three main characters or key characters at least. Uh, Danso, who's a scholar, who's the person in this beautiful artwork over um, cover art, right? Um, and then we have Lilong, who's a warrior from, a sort of like mysterious warrior from an island that shouldn't exist that sort of comes into Danso's city. Uh, and then the third person is Shemi, who is a fixer's daughter, uh, and she is intended, she's Danso's intended, which means they're, they're uh, promised to be married. Um, and this scene follows Shemi, right? Uh, and, the, and sort of opens up the relationship she has with her mother, who is a fixer, but um, doesn't really want Shemi to be her, but at the same time wants her to like, take the lessons that she gives her. So this is this sort of highlights the kind of relationship they have. The holding stalls of the Nem household were on the ground floor, but not below ground as with most of the city's holding facilities. 
Nem thought on the ground holding smelled too bad and were difficult to clean. Of course, it was unheard of for a private home to have its own holding at all. Detention and jailing were the responsibility of the civic guard and the local government of each ward. But in Nem's line of work, there were times when people needed to be handled outside the usual channels. The stalls were instead set aside in a separate building from the main household, adjacent to the Praga stables, carefully locked, guarded, and disguised so that anyone who wasn't looking couldn't find them. Here, Nem stood with a shemi in the semi-stable, semi-prison interior, their water-resistant cloaks dripping from the walk from the main house in the rain. Oboda stood next to them, boots squishing with water as he shuffled, impatient. Outside, rain lashed at the thatch roof. The man they came to see was speechless upon their arrival. He had been strung up from the rafters by a rope pulley, the strain in his shoulder joints clear from a darkness building there, blood communing at the wrong point. In addition to being starved of food and water, it was obvious he'd been whipped, his back opened with bleeding scars. He was now so faint, he looked asleep, but was, in fact, slowly dying. Do you recognize this man? Nem asked her daughter. Ashemi squinted in the light, green with unease as she always was whenever Nem brought her here, but stoic in the face of it. She stood straight backed and nodded. Good, Nem said, an idle hand on her chin. You should never forget a face that has wronged you. And in this case, not just you, anyone who lays a hand on your intended disrespects this whole household. What do you want to do with him? Ashemi asked. Oboda will flog him some more, Nem said. Then I will make sure he's sent over the border and can never return. The border is closed, Ashemi said. So that's impossible. We'll have to do something else. Like? Kill him. Shock didn't quite register on Nem's face, but something moved within her, and it was not a pang of nostalgia. It was something that showed up every now and then when, even after dealing with some of the most despicable people in her line of work, she could not quite come to terms with this side of the Shemi. There was something primal about the girl, a vindictive desire to demonstrate always that she was capable of anything. And she was, but that wasn't Nem's worry. Nem was more concerned that whatever path lay ahead of her daughter could be destroyed by this relentlessness before it even had a chance to manifest. Are you sure? Nem asked. He's going to die at some point anyway, Ashemi said, matter of factly. Better to be buried in the welcoming humus here than the harsh and unforgiving sands of the Savannah Belt, where his spirit may never know any rest. Nem waited. Okay, fine. Shemi said. It shows weakness if we let him go. Nem turned to look at the civic guard. He had opened his eyes now and was attempting to speak, but his lips were parched, unable to stretch properly. Obuda held up a finger to silence the man, then unclipped his runku from his waist and swung it so that it made a deadly whoosh with the air. He set the heavy head on the ground and leaned on the weapon, looking to Nem but also to Ishemi, waiting for a decision. You have always said you want me to learn, Ishemi said. You say you want people to think of us with respect. Well, when people think of us, this is what we should want them to remember, that even the slightest errors against us will not be tolerated. Nem regarded her daughter, perturbed. This, exactly, was why she had insisted that Ishemi join the council guild. She belonged to that life, to the Idu ways, one that required balance, not this one of blood and depravity, designless. Nem was doing everything she could to teach Ishemi to be streetwise, decisive, ambitious, but also to temper that with shrewd prudence, keep the order of things from going askance. The latter never stuck, though, and each day, Shemi's affinity for the deep end grew in a way that unsettled Nem. This time, however, maybe she was right. 
Maybe Nem was growing soft. Perhaps this is why Abu So thought he could bully her. Perhaps she should be doing more to carve her name into the fabric of Basak. So Nem nodded at Obuda. Obuda moved swiftly. In two or three steps, he lifted the runku and swung. There was a crack of thunder outside. Wind swept in and the fires in the room shifted. Nem placed a firm hand on her daughter's neck in case she tried to turn away, but the Shemi did not. Nem was proud of her for it, but concerned she had just let burn a fire she could not extinguish. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna put this away. <laughs> um, that's one of my favorite scenes in the book. Um, uh, and I'm, I always, I'm always glad to read it <laughs> every time. <laughs> Thank you. It's pretty brutal. <laughs> <laughs> it very is. revealing, <laughs> like a character, right? So, yeah. Cool. Excellent. So I have to start with um, asking you why epic fantasy? Uh, because Son of the Storm is a big, sprawling epic fantasy. You've created this incredible world, uh, unique unto itself with influences, um, like Nigerian influences and other African influences, and I'm sure influences of your own imagination, mm -hmm. uh, with these three sort of main characters on this collision course. Um, so very similar to sort of what I did in my own epic fantasy. <laughs> so clearly this, there's something about the genre that calls for this. So why epic fantasy for you? What are sort of your fantasy influences? And then what are the tropes like the ones I mentioned that, you know, you kind of keep and then what are the ones you just sort of threw out? What are the ones that don't work for you? Hmm. That's, a, that's a loaded question. Um, yeah, so I'm you can break it here. down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start from here, which is that I didn't really think of it as epic fantasy. And I, I guess this is a good place to start because a lot of what we think of about, a lot of what we all these stories are, are, are terms that we use to say we recognize what the story is doing um, based on what other stories have done before it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I started writing Son of the Storm and The Nameless Republic in general, I was thinking secondary world. That's really what I was thinking. I was like, I'm going to tell the story, but it's just going to be a world that I'm going to build, okay? That's not uh, contemporary. That's it. I never thought epic. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the epicness of it comes from the fact that this world is big and sprawling and the story has impact that could be world, um, you know, spanning. Um, even if we're talking about three characters here, th their choices end up being, having like this snowball effect that could affect more, much more things. Uh, and I guess that's where the epicness of it comes from, but I didn't really think about that. Um, so I didn't, I wouldn't say I made a choice to write epic fantasy, but I guess as I started to write, the choices I made were uh, in what we would, in line with what we would call <laughs> epic fantasy. Um, but at the same time, I would say maybe subconsciously, there was a part of me that was, that was doing that because that was writing, you know, epic fantasy, I was, as we say, because um, where I started from, for instance, was, um, the, you know, the, the Benin kingdom, or the Benin empire, which, which ran from like 1100 to like um, 1800 maybe, um, was like one of the biggest in, in, in what we will call modern day Nigeria, uh, Southern Nigeria at least. Um, it ran almost from like West to almost fully the East uh, of current Southern Nigeria. And it was like very influential in its day. Um, and, I, and I am from Benin city, which is what, is the last like city left of this like massive kingdom because everything else has been like chopped up into states and you know post colonially it has really like been reduced to this like tiny city huh. where you can still find the vestiges of that the king's palace is still there in the center of the city there's like this massive museum that gives you all the history but i grew up there like i lived there for 20 something years um and I never really got to see the city that way, right? Um, there was always, I guess, like the narrative around the city was like, oh, it was just this old place that was just full of like civil servants and like no one went there. Everyone left Benin to somewhere else. Uh, and, and, and I guess that's like one of the stories I swallowed. And so when I moved out, you know, when I was done, 
um, I moved. But then when I started coming back, when I started coming back to like my parents' house for vacations and like um, holidays and stuff, I would notice like something in the city that I hadn't really seen in the same way. Cause I was starting to like look at the city with new eyes. And so sometimes I would take, I would be like, okay, I'm gonna go out into like, you know, the city center or like some other place and just like learn more. And I started to see like little vestiges of like this old massive and very like big empire, right? I would see like, you know, a small part of a moat somewhere partially filled or like a crumbling wall in, in some part or like a statue or some legend with like the story written with like, you know, half of it like, you know, degraded or something. And I started to think, wait, this is like really massive stuff. Uh, and I started to like get more into it. And, and that's really where the idea, I was like, okay, this can't just like stay here. <laughs> Cause like, this is too good. This is too good to, to not represent in some way more than what it is right now. Um, and so that's really where it started from. I was like, okay, I want to tell a story um, and, and, and sort of like reignite a lot of or re-represent a lot of what this looked like in its heyday. Um, not, I wasn't going to tell the story of Benin, the Benin Empire, but I wanted to draw on that and sort of like re-represent what a lot of West African empires of the time were like in the, at their peak. Um, and, and But then I didn't just stop at Benin because I was thinking about like what other, you know, spaces orbited that empire. How did they trade? Who did they trade with? Why? What were the decisions they made? You know, and so I started, that started like ballooning past just that empire into like the others, like Mali, Songhai, Ghana, um, uh, that like surrounded it. And so um, that, that pretty much is where I started from. And I guess that's where like the epicness of everything starts from. Yeah. Um, you know, I, yeah. I had very similar, I think, impulses uh, in writing Black Sun. Like, I just felt like there was this untapped potential of like uh, pre-Columbian Mesoamerican cultures that you never got to see in epic fantasy. Sort of we, epic fantasy, particularly like a few years ago, even five years ago, seemed very stuck on like Western European like sort of setting. Yeah. And now we see yeah. more and more, we see some East Asian influences and South Asian and of yeah. course African, but um, that feels fairly new. That feels like there's sort of this untapped uh, sort of potential. There's all these stories waiting to be re reawoken or like reimagined and not yeah. historically, like you said, it's not a one-on-one. -on -one. You're not trying to tell the history of like the Benin empire, but you're trying to yeah, show yeah. sort of the, the influences of not just it, but all the cultures surrounding it and how rich they were and how diverse they were. Exactly. And like, uh, you know, showing them come together. So I definitely got that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> so, but tell me a little bit, is there anything, um, in the books that you've read, like I, I feel like sometimes I'm in conversation, not not particularly, um, I'm in conversation with like sort of the epic fantasies that came before me, uh, yeah. whether I want to be or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so while I'm trying to do my own thing, I definitely see, you know, sort of that I'm responding to, or I'm rejecting this, or I'm in yeah. influenced by this. So do you have any of those thoughts as well? Yeah, yeah. Um... One of the things that uh, a lot of people say about Son of Storm now that it, it's being read is, um, oh, this is this really um, takes risks or or it breaks the rules. Um, and I guess well, the first thing I always want to do with my stories is remind people that rules are only expectations, um, and expectations only are based on um, what stories have become the normative over time and have come before this one. So what is seen as a risk, I guess, sometimes it's not a risk, that's like literally how this story is told. Um, and it feels pretty natural to me. So like one of the things I wanted to do was to demonstrate how even within the, you know, normative or expected structures or frameworks for telling epic fantasy stories, uh, quests, um, warriors, um, beasts, fantastic beasts or whatever, there, there are still stories that don't always, you know, fit into the same envelopes, right? Um, so this is a quest story. There is a quest, but it's not your typical quest. It's not even typical people that go on quests. Um, 
they don't ride into the sunset right off to battle with like horse or anything. It's like a really trudge through the, you know, difficult terrain in a very different way than, you know, than taking a ring to model. <laughs> um, right. right. It's, it's, uh, they're fantastic beats, but they're not the fantastic beats you expect because <laughs> we don't have only just like five to 10 fantastic beasts in all of Epic Fantasy. We have hundreds and some of, many of them have not even like been, they've not even gotten like one representation. And this is even if we, we we're not talking, this is us even talking outside of regular ex beasts that we all understand, like dragons, right? Dragons. We're talking like completely new stuff that you've never even thought could happen, but they, you know, they could be imagined like, not necessarily yeah. replaced, but like represented in these stories in a way that feels familiar, but also different. And I yeah. guess so that's really what I was trying to do. Uh, I was trying to do, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 hey, let's, so let's talk about those beasts and those unusual characters. First of all, I hear you on the beast. I actually have a giant water strider which is a water bug, <laughs> which I thought was quite fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I have like winged serpents. So you have a lightning bat, is this correct? That is so correct. talk a little bit about why you chose that as your sort of fantastic beast and, and, and who that is or what that is to you. <laughs> um, so lightning bats are actually a, a thing. Um, in in this is this is something I think will be likely more prevalent to in the southern parts of Africa, but there are also parts of West Africa that have their own variations. Sometimes they're they're birds, mostly they're like giant birds who can like who many people believe are like witches who turn into birds and like pull down lightning and strike feet striking people. Some of them believe these birds only come out when there's heavy thunderstorms. Mm. So there are all these myths. Um, but I wanted to change that from just a bird because the kind of bird has always like been different um, across the different cultures. So I went for a bat instead because that's just very unusual. But also because I wanted something that looked like a dragon but was like not a dragon at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there was that. Um, and then of course, like the way the bat uses lightning, I also wanted that to be sort of similar to the way a dragon would use fire, but like mm -hmm. not the same thing at all. Um, uh, and it, the, because the bat doesn't actually like spit lightning or use lightning from itself, but like draws on it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So um, it, it was, it was, yeah, it was kind of like that conversation. I was like, how do I do this in a way that it's, it's like, yeah, I, I think I get this, but at the same time, you're like, this is completely new. So it was also new to me in many ways, but I figure like a lot of people who come from the cultures that have um, the lightning birds and, and the mm -hmm. vampire, vampire bats, vampire birds, will recognize this like instantly. They'd be like, I know what this is. Um, so yeah, I was doing that. I was doing that with the beast. I was doing that with the characters too. Cause like um, the the protagonist is a scholar, right? He's at, he works, he's a trainee, trainee at the university, trainee, trainee storyteller really. Um, and I was also thinking about what that means because um, Son of the Storm really is a story about stories really. It's about how stories are used and it only makes sense, I guess, you know, like if we're talking about how stories are used to, to keep power, right? How they're used to paint a picture that retains power. And, and, and if you can keep telling those stories, then you can keep holding power from those people who, who you know, may feel or, or keep telling people that they're powerless and they will believe it. Um, and so I wanted someone who, who oh, was sort ahead. of like straddling, you know, those two spaces of, of being, you know, the recipient of these stories to keep them down, but at the same time also propagating the, the stories, you know, so like Danso at the core embodies that for, and that's why like it was an easy choice. Um, it also, you know, upturns the whole uh, swashbuckling warrior as protagonist um, thing in Epic Fantasy and all of that. Yeah, and he's a very unusual character, uh, Danso, who's your main character, who's this scholar. He is uh, you, you're, so your world is this very sort of straighted caste system, right? Yep. Uh, and he is in some ways at the very bottom, but in, in some ways he's privileged uh, because yep. he is part of this university system and he is sort of like um, a storyteller, uh, yep. which is more like um, a keeper of history, a keeper of stories, right? Is that exactly. fair to say? Yeah. So so it's it's more of a traditional concept of the function of a storyteller in a, in a prehistorical society. Um, yep. 
so talk, you know, <laughs> uh, being like a black and native woman who attended an Ivy League university, you know, I had some feelings about him. <laughs> and so how somehow in some ways you're at the very bottom, but you're allowed this little like peek into privilege. But of yeah. course, you know, at the beginning of the book, things start to go wrong for him pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. And he gets in trouble and, and his privilege is immediately, you know, you see what shaky ground he stands on. Uh, so talk a little bit about why you chose uh, to, for him to be sort of this person between two worlds or sort of stuck in this dichotomy. And does that reflect at all your experiences? Yeah, yeah, in, <laughs> in various ways. Um, so uh, it, I, I, could, I could go on and on about this, but even to start from, I grew up in Benin City. I grew up pretty much in the University of Benin with my parents are both professors. And so mm -hmm. even within that small space, right, even in that city, most people are like not very privileged. Most people aren't the kinds of people who would get access. Um, uh, and even if I, I wouldn't say I did um, within the grand context of things, like even if it's just nationally, right? Um, coming from Benin and come, like have uh, in terms of like, say in comparison to people who like live and grew up in Lagos and how, how much access they would likely have um, by virtue of like socioeconomic class and stuff like that. Um, even that relatively, I wouldn't say I like had, could hold a candle to them. And then of course, like if you even stretch that globally, like folks from other nations that like have much more resources, but at the same time within that space, I was also privileged because I was in this university. I was also getting access to things that there were people literally next door to me. Like I remember this one time, like we even had like, if, the, the, even the people next door would like literally have nothing to eat. And it's not like they're like, you know, begging in the street or anything, but they're like really, really disenfranchised in many ways. Um, and so it's like, it's, you're in this like middle spot uh, and you can easily compare and contrast even in, within the small space. And then of course, as someone like me who grew up like that and understand and understood that dynamic, I, I then ended up like moving a bit, a lot. I moved a lot around Nigeria. I lived in the East and the North and I ended up living in Lagos, which is in the West. And then I moved out of the country and I've lived in multiple countries. <laughs> and so like, I've been able to always at every point situate that. I've been able to say, okay, this is where I come from. This is what, I, I've been always able to decide how my axis of intersections, um, like what axis I exist on based on all these intersections and how some of them hold certain kinds of privileges and some of them mean that I will be underprivileged or, or, or underrepresented or less privileged or, you know, in, in whatever place I find myself. So I'm always like acutely aware of how these axes connect and I'm always aware of what that means. And I guess for Danso, I was trying to portray how, what happens when you, you don't pay attention to that, wow. when, when you don't really think about what this means, right? Um, and it's, it gets very easy to get sucked into the parts that you feel give you, um, what's the word, um, that, that help you like move easily through society, right? Danso is in this university, he keeps forgetting. And I guess, you know, they never, it's, it's all like every chance everyone gets, they want to remind him that, hey, don't, rem don't forget where you come from. We remember, even if you don't. Um, and at the same time, he remembers and he's like aware of that, but he's also not paying attention to how having this access makes him makes it, make the same mistakes that the people with this access make. Um, and I guess he starts to learn that later on, I guess, when he comes in contact with Lilong, who always is like very happy to point out his faults and say, hey, uh, you're not paying attention to this thing. Um, so yeah, it kind of like is like that. Uh, and it, of course, like, also being in academia, <laughs> I could easily like draw like those parallels um, with Danza. And it was like, um, it was like almost one, one, one on one to one sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so the other two characters you mentioned, you read from Ashimi's point of view uh, for your uh, opening reading. And then you just mentioned Li Long, who's the other mm -hmm. character. Can you tell us just a little bit about each one of those and the role they play in your sure. story? <laughs> so, so Li Long is the catalyst pretty much um, because she comes from a place that everyone in Basa believes doesn't exist because they believe the islands, the islands she comes from should have sunk. Um, but Li Long comes from um, a place that's also trying to like not reveal itself to the world because they have some power that they believe if Basa gets wind of, it will want control of. 
Um, and, but, and, and then Lilong comes into this place with that power. Um, and in, that, that's the magic of Ibor, right, um, in, the, in the book. And I guess one of the things uh, I wanted to explain there was, I wanted, I wanted to put forward there with that character was to think about how power manifests in various ways, right? Sometimes it's magic, sometimes it's socioeconomic power, sometimes it's something similar as like, uh, something as simple as having just much more land or just much, much more resources uh, like soil to grow good food. Um, it could just, you know, sometimes the power is stories, is telling people, uh, reminding or, or, or telling, sowing the seed in people's minds that they're smaller than they actually are and getting them to believe it and probably even propagate it. Um, so I was trying to like do that. And Li Long was sort of like the nexus of a bit of them because like socioeconomically, she doesn't have that much power in Basa uh, because technically she doesn't even exist. Um, she has magic, but like it's not as useful outside of like physical use or something. But then it's in the impact of someone else with all the other power getting that in addition to what they have is like probably very massive. Yeah, so she's not really aware of the, she's aware of the like importance of that, but like is really just like working with survival for the most part of the book. So it's like survival means preventing this power that's not in my hands from growing. So she's accurately aware of how much power she and her people have, even when the power they have is supposed to be like this big thing, right? It's magic, but at the same time, it's not really enough because, you know, it doesn't, you know, you have magic, but like if you don't have the people, if you don't have the land, if you don't even have the fighters or whatever, like what can you do with that? Um, and, and she like gets into Danzo's orbit, right? <laughs> And that's always in this space where he believes something completely different about the world. And they always, so she was like really his foil in mm -hmm. many ways saying, look, you have to really rethink your understanding of stories, of power, of all these things that you think you know about the world. Um, and I think her, her um, while working through for survival, she's learning, she's teaching Danso how to really open his eyes to what the world really is. But at the same time, Danso is teaching her how to be a bit more trusting to people like he doesn't believe his naivety is like can someone be really be this naive like she's like completely distrustful of everyone and everything but then starts to see like the earnestness in Danso and sort of like buys into that um and that sort of like opens her up more to the world so they sort of like bring each other to this space where they meet in the middle which is something that is the complete opposite of what anyone would have thought would happen when someone from the Basa and from these islands meet. meet. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, that's kind of like what Lilong does. Uh, and then Ashemi, of course, is uh, pretty much a study in, in if, you, if you're stuck between spaces, right? In, uh -huh. If you're stuck between spaces in the world that, doesn't, that hasn't actually made space for people like you that don't really fit into these neat um, divisions, how do you make space for yourself? Some people like Danso want to make space for themselves by making the world a better place, maybe. While people like <laughs> Shemi want to make space for themselves by blowing everything up and saying, well, if I blew everything up, then there'll be no divisions. See, so maybe I should just blow everything up. <laughs> so Shemi is pretty much a stud study in that character. It right? starts out pretty much almost an underdog in the same way that Danso mm -hmm. is, in a different way, but similar but then decides to take a completely different path to solving that problem. And she does solve the problem eventually, but it is, um, no spoilers, but like, it, it is not good. It, it is a good solution <laughs> for her, but it is not good for everyone else. So I, I like I, her, it's <laughs> yeah. one of my favorites. <laughs> and you have a like, wonderful scene of her uh, early in the book uh, where she goes to court uh, essentially, and she's studying sort of the lawyers, the equivalent of the yeah, lawyers, yeah. Uh, as they argue for their clients. And I just thought that was just a great scene, great insight into like, you know, the study of people and like, that's yeah. kind of what she's all about and like kind of figuring out how people work. Uh, yeah. So then she can blow shit up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's, that's really what I was trying to do. Like Shemi is like studying people to 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 use them to use that against for her purposes sort of yeah. um why danso is learning to understand how people work within systems 
so he can he can better tell better stories about them mm. and 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 understand them and use that to you know be better in the world pretty much or make things better so they're trying to make things better but differently and taking different routes but they sort of like orbit each other those paths um and when they eventually come together um, in the end it's again as i said it's not pretty for anyone involved <laughs> and so one of the things i love uh, also about your characters is they're fairly morally gray or there's a lot of room there uh to understand you know morality and i think this is sort of a general movement in contemporary fantasy anyway we're sort of mm -hmm. moving away from you know sort of the good versus evil mm -hmm. uh sort of lord of the rings clear cut here's the bad guys here's the good guys it's a little more nuanced you know it's more about like human nature and the choices that yeah. we make and the consequences of those choices mm -hmm. uh, and i think you know you really see that in your characters too is that everyone eventually has to face the consequences of their choices yeah 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 i i was i was i guess really just thinking about the fact that um i don't know somehow every character that's that's like most interesting is one that you can see the humanness you know as you mm. said them. and that often means them making mistakes some of them even grand ones and some of them ones they can't come back from um yeah I think that was like front and center for me um in, in characterizing these three people yeah excellent so uh we have about five more minutes I'm going to ask you questions and then we're going to open it up for Q&A so there mm -hmm. is a Q&A box uh if anyone has any questions you can put them in the Q&A box and I will take a look at them or we will all take a look at them in like five minutes uh so please uh don't be shy feel free to ask your questions um and i'm going to shift gears a little bit i want to ask you a little bit about sort of craft and writing uh okay. and sort of your process uh in general uh and so i know that son of the storm is the first book in a trilogy and i know your previous book which i believe was your debut right uh yes. god hunter david what's david's last yeah. name David Mogo, God Hunter. <laughs> David Mogo. That's the one right there. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and there's a little more of an urban fantasy, actually, right? But it was a standalone. Um, yeah. And now you're writing a trilogy. Uh, yeah. And so what is that like? What are the differences for you? Did Do you know how your trilogy is going to end? <laughs> That's the question I always get. Um, I do not you know. know <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> do you have a general uh, idea like how do you plan for a trilogy or do you not I know <laughs> um that's a good question I would say <laughs> I have an I have a general sense um of where the narrative is going but I'm really thinking more about the decisions that the characters will make mm. um, I'm I'm currently like working um on book two um War of the Wind and I understand for that one, I clearly understand the decisions that the characters are going to make. Um, but for the trilogy as a whole, um, I have an idea of what I think wants to be the like the wrap up theme for each character, right? Like what where are they going to have moved to at mm -hmm. the end? I kind of get a sense of that, right? Danzo starts out in this place and I know, okay, Danzo is going to end up in this point at this point. How he's going to get there, I don't know. Will that change probably also? Mm -hmm. um, and I know, you know, the same thing for the other two characters, but I'm also thinking about like where Bassa ends up, right? Bassa as, a, mm -hmm. as, the, as the central hub of this world, mm -hmm. right? How, where does it move from, right? It starts out at this as this failing city and nation, and it has sort of like moved into something else by the end of book one, and will likely move into something else again by the end of book two. So like, what's the final form of Basa? Mm -hmm. What's the final form of each character? That's kind of like what I think about when I'm thinking about what the, so I don't, I can't say what, like, this is how the book's gonna end or the series is gonna end, but I can say, I'm thinking the final form of this space and the, these people are gonna be something like this. Um, and then I can just like work work my way toward, toward that, yeah. Yeah, so more character arc than plot. Like, and I, I think that's so. what actually makes the good story, right? Because yeah. if you have your character arcs in place and you sort of know your final form, as you said, of your yeah. of your main characters, then the, the plot is is sort of almost secondary in my mind. Yeah. You know, how we get them there is, is not as quite as important as that they get there 
you know, at all. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. It's like it's like I have to basically choose what events will have to nudge them in that direction, as opposed to, um, you know, like do these events you know particularly have to happen? You know, the events can like are, are probably interchangeable, um, right. and, and all of that. As 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 to the um, question about, um, about you know moving from contemporary work to ep, you know mm. trilogy or to trilogy. I, it wasn't my intention. <laughs> I, I just started building the world. Uh, I started writing the story and I was like, oh, this is not the story that's going to end in one book. So <laughs> I was like, oops, I guess this is a trilogy now. <laughs> it, was more, it was more of that than anything. Fair enough. And so when you do world build, like I know for me, I world build from character out. Uh, but I know that that's sort of unusual. Not everybody does that. Uh, yeah. So often I'll have a character and I'm like, what do they need? And then from there, mm. I sort of go, oh, they need this, and then there'll be this. And then so it's sort of more this process. But a lot of folks who particularly write fantasy do all the world building up front. Uh, mm. what, what do you do? What's your sort of approach to world building? So I usually, um, I think of it as like um, extrapolation. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I pick, I pick the, the, I, the, the things that are shifts or deviations from the world as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, some of you know the nameless republic, for instance, the world of Un has two two moons, right? That's one deviation, right? Um, um, the magic, another deviation. So I pick you know what those major deviations are and what they mean for that world. Uh, it's also you know the world also has like one continent as opposed to like R seven, mm -hmm. and so like the nations are different and everything. And so I pick that, and then I, I sort of like give a skeletal. Um, extrapolation of that what does this mean for the world what does it mean for politics what does it mean for economy right oh, oh if this is a desert biome which means whoever lives here is probably not going to have a lot of water are they going to move to where this water who lives there are they going to prevent them are they going to welcome them is there a treaty blah 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 i would make all of those like i would ask a lot of questions what do two moons mean um in sun of the storm for instance it means you you know sea travel is virtually impossible because tidal waves are like really high Wow. Um, it means there's there, there are moon crossings, which means what, every time the moons orbit, they probably cross at some point, which means there's sort of like a lunar eclipse, but two moons instead of a sun. So like the, all those things, do they have some cultural significance? Do people worship the moons? I ask a lot of those questions. And then after that, I say, okay, so what is the story I want to tell? And who is the best person to tell it? Tell it and where does it take place in this world? And once I do that, I start asking questions outside, you know, about what orbits that person. Um, Danso is a good example, he's a scholar. Uh, where does he go? Okay, he goes to university, which means there's a university, which means this must be a, a you know, place. And so like the questions just build and build and build. But I, I build particularly detailed stuff as is needed for the story and the characters uh -huh. that, or, and what orbits the characters. So like what's most detailed is what orbits the characters that are there. And then as needed, as the story progresses, I build more and more, but I have like that skeletal initial extrapolation. For David Mogo, it was gods dropping to the city of Lagos and I just built from there. What does that mean economically? What does it mean sociopolitically? What does it mean for religion? What does it mean for all these things? Uh, and then what does it mean for David, who's a demigod? Um, mm -hmm. And then sort of like just building from there, sort of. And so do you keep a organized tabbed notebook of all your details or do you sort of go by the seat of your pants like what's it going to be like writing book three <laughs> i i think I, i'm not gonna lie um i i, I look up my own book to find mm. out what happens honestly um so i do i keep notes yes are they organized that is debatable <laughs> so, um yeah i i do keep copious notes um not physical ones, um, mostly, I, I actually start a Google site for my oh. worlds. Yeah, so I could just be like, oh, magic, click, um, or whatever, click. And then when I want to add to it, I sometimes would keep everything in the dock. And then when, when, it, when it's like filled up, I would like put it on the site. That way I can always find it and stuff like that. And I can like navigate it really quickly, uh, especially when it starts to balloon. Um, but I think mostly I just like, it's honestly, it's still haphazard. It's just a lot of links, it's a lot of links to places and, and documents and stuff. And it's a lot of copy and pasting. It's just like not very 
honestly not very good but <laughs> i will try to be better about that <laughs> as i go forward yeah. i am not very good either so it's okay <laughs> i feel like it's okay um so i have kind of a fun question this is i always like to ask i'm a big uh i'm very influenced by music when i write mm. um i always create like a little soundtrack for uh, each novel it has sort of like its playlist uh do you listen to music when you write or does music influence you at all yes um, well, I wouldn't say influence. It's more of like a mood thing, I think. In mm -hmm. like, so yeah, it is influential in that sense. What I do is I don't often make playlists. I did have make a playlist. In fact, I have a playlist for Son of the Storm. It's like, if you Ooh. check like my, my website book page, there is. And I gave like, you know, like this is the play, this is the song you should listen for like this chapter. I actually did that because I, I did that, right? I did that. I was like, this is a song that follows a Shemi in chapters two and three, something like that. Um, and that's because Son of the Storm I wrote at a time that was very haphazard and like the music really helped me get through it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I could be writing something where I just need one song or like one playlist that embodies. So a good example is if I was writing something young adult, for instance, mm -hmm. and I needed like a playlist of like the 2021 top pop songs, it doesn't mean anything but it just means that it gives, it situates me in a place that I want to be thinking about and a certain mindset that I want to, you know, framework that I want to be thinking through. And so it's just like the music playing in the background. I don't remember the names. Maybe one st song gets stuck in my head maybe and I mm -hmm. would play that song over and over, but it's, like, it's more like situating me in this space. Um, yeah. So it's, it kind of like works more like that um, for me. And I, yes, I do listen to that when uh, music in that way when I write. Yeah, so sort of like mood or tone. And like, yeah, I know yeah, for me, yeah. it's very Pavlovian. Like if I put on that certain song, I can get like in that headspace very quickly mm -hmm. that I know this is, you know, what I'm working on. Suddenly I'm in, you know, my secondary world because, you know, that song That's, triggered that feeling that or that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is very, very cool. Excellent. Well, I'm going to see, let's see. Oh, I went over. We only have eight minutes. Let's see, we only have one question so far. So okay. Okay, and this is from Javier. He asks, how are dancers and your own life related in terms of academia and discrimination? Oh, we talked a little bit about that, but do you want to say a yeah. little more? Yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say <laughs> academia is like, <laughs> it's a tricky space, right? As I said, it, it's knowledge creation, but then it's a lot of, it's a lot of, how do I put it? You're in this intermediary space where, where you are participating in knowledge creation, but you're also a lot of the time having to interrogate what that knowledge is doing, you know, where it's coming from, who it serves, why it needs to be passed down in certain ways, um, you know. And as someone who comes from a space where a lot of work that academia has done in the past has not been very helpful, um, <laughs> you know, to the people where I come from, it requires even that more interrogation. And so I, I guess, um, again, as I said, I grew up in university, right? A lot of things I was taught and I understand, like I was taught and understand, like when I was much younger, I, I remember how I imbibed, like swallowed a lot of them and like even internalized them in very harmful ways. And that's what I was thinking about for dancer. And then of course, like much older when I actually, started you know working in academia which is different from being like a recipient i started to like revisit the hows and whys of things and um, practices um you know the knowledge itself um and all and, and 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 the purposes of all these things i guess that is really what i was hoping danso would do or I, danso ends up doing because he's like okay so wait um so why do they tell us this because and sometimes he's asking someone he's asking someone like Lilong these things he's like why do so why do they tell us if it's not true right mm -hmm. or, or if it doesn't correctly represent the truth and she's like why do you think and he he's finding it hard to like believe like so you mean I've been like spending my time learning all these things and they're just like not true and he's having like a hard time believing that um and I, I think I've like gone through all these phases at different times um to like have and have arrived at this place now where I can say, okay, I actually understand how these systems work. And even if I'm still like a work in progress where there will be always this one thing thing at a time, um, at some point where I'll be like, hey, 
Um, that's something I now I, I now understand that I need to interrogate. Mm-hmm. It's like having that consciousness to start is really what I um, is really one of the things that I have experienced and understood um, post experience. And like that's the path that Danso is taking in the book. He's like gaining that consciousness uh, to the point where he can now start to make those interrogations for himself without, um, yeah, without needing to be nudged or prodded to do that. So. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, I kind of like filtered a lot. Um, I have a lot of academia in my life. Uh, my parents are both professors, as I said. So like, it's not, it's not, none of it is new. Uh, and so the university felt like a very good place to situate down. So, and um, yeah, <laughs> I did draw on a lot between my own experience within academia and also like what scholarship looked like in the middle ages on the African continent as a whole. Yeah, and wow, and that really sets up his character arc uh, to be something quite interesting. I can't wait to see what he does <laughs> in book two. Uh, and speaking of book two, uh, tell us a little bit uh, about what you're, what else you're working on. You mentioned that you're working on the second book. Uh, yes. What did you say it was? Warrior of the Wind. What did you exactly. say? Exactly. Oh, it is. Okay. It is called Warrior of the Wind. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure this is like being announced or anything, but it's like literally oh. at the back of the book so if you like bought it and you flip to the back you'd see it says coming in 2022 warrior of the wind um and 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 book one is really like at the core danso's book but book two at the core is going to be lilong's book um because yeah so we get to spend a lot of time outside of basa we you know follow lilong to her homeland and we get to see what that's like um and i also uh, so people always ask me like what promises do you have for the forthcoming books um more beasts to start with (laughs) Uh, more beasts more unconventional beasts and maybe not unconventional but like not as conventional beasts Mm -hmm. um more um i have promised heist a heist at least one heist so (laughs) i promised one heist uh and i have promised uh sentient hurricane i keep saying this and i know it's i'm gonna it's gonna make its way in there somewhere but this is just like a promise um but yeah Let's uh, fingers crossed for a sentient heart, Kane. <laughs> Excellent. I will. I will hold you to it. I will look for it. <laughs> and I know you have other projects going on besides this. Tell us what else you have. Oof. Let's see. So I do have uh, a YA novel <laughs> that I just oh, completed. Nice. That um, it, it's actually going out on sub, like as I speak. Um, it's with. It's like in the hands of editors. So um, <laughs> you will be hearing something about it soon. <laughs> and fingers crossed. Um, that you hear something about it soon. I just finished working on that. Now I'm working on something middle grade. Um, I have already worked on some middle grade work and shorter work. Um, that's it right here, right? That's it, Black Boy Joy. Oh. It was edited by Kwame Mbalia. Uh, and I'm, now I'm working on something much lengthier. Um, and and I have really like, I've always wanted to not just write for adult and write for like various ages, but um, I, I pers- particularly like have a special place for like writing for younger African children because like often they don't really get to be part of the conversation when we're talking about like stories for children. So, um, so yeah, um, currently I'm I'm doing that. I'm working on book two. Um, I have some other projects that I have dabbled in that I'm not at liberty to talk about, but um, I have written something that is novella length and I am working on um that will how do I describe this without (laughs) but (laughs) let's just call let's call it something that's like more science fantastic than science fiction or fantasy nice yeah and and it's more it's futuristic but it's also science Mm -hmm. fantastic um very a big detour from like (laughs) everything I have written before so um yeah that's that's a bunch of stuff that I'm working on And I know we just have, I think, one minute left. Uh, I want to ask you who, I always like to ask authors this, who are you reading right now? What other books by other authors are you reading uh, that you're enjoying uh, or that you want to like shout out? Yeah, so I am actually working, I have a panel with these three folks in like a few weeks. I'm reading these books. The first one is A Master of Gin. Oh, I loved it. (laughs) This is a good book, dopest book. Um, this just came out literally on the same day as Son of Storm. So if you haven't gotten this, you should get it. The second one is No Gods, No Monsters. Oh, I read that one too. (laughs) Um, This is also great. Um, I have already like peeked in it. It's 
great. I already like what I see. And the third is Among Thieves by MJ oh, Kuhn. I have that one on my <laughs> QBR too. Excellent. So yeah, these are three books that I am um, I'm dipping into, um, you know, and, and just like working through right now. So and I every there it's interesting like how I guess what I'm really learning about this because this is all work that's like out right now and I'm really I think like it's start, it's starting to capture I'm starting to see a sense of like what the cultural zeitgeist mm. is around like fantastic work yes. and and a lot of it really really um skews non-traditional and mm -hmm. this these three books sort of give me a sense of like what non-normative looks like when it starts to permeate the normative um, and I'm really looking forward to like more stories like these. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, I don't know where our host is. Uh, it is eight o'clock on the dot. Oh, look, I see hey. your fears. Perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much to you and Rebecca. That was honestly an, an amazing conversation. I, I'm sure everyone else can agree. Um, this is great. Yeah, I, I want to thank, thank everybody you. who came out tonight to watch the event. Um, if you didn't get it all it'll actually be available on our youtube channel very soon so you can always watch it there as well and yeah i just want to say thank you and have a great evening to everyone all right thank you so much thank, thank you. you green thank apple you, books Rebecca. thank you green thank apple so much. <laughs> thank you so thank you Good thank luck you everything. hi everyone thanks for coming <laughs>